Yeah, neutrinos, they're kind of a bit of a cop-out as a particle because they're kind of hardly there at all. They have very little, if any, mass. They have no electrical charge. Um, they go piling straight through pretty much anything. They're very hard to stop. If you really wanted to stop a neutrino, uh, I heard someone do a calculation that you'd actually need four light years of lead. So you need a huge amount of lead in order to actually have a decent chance of stopping a neutrino. They're abundant, and yet we don't see them. They're so difficult to see. They're produced in the sun. They're produced when you have fusion. If you get four protons, say four hydrogen nuclei, they bind together then they want to form helium, that's what fusion is. An atom of helium is two protons and two neutrons. Now I've started with four protons, so I've got to convert two protons to two neutrons. And the way that I would do that is that the proton emits a positron, it's called, that's the antiparticle of the electron, and a neutrino. That neutrino then shoots out of the sun and heads towards us. One of the big issues with neutrinos is whether they have any mass or not. Um, and this turns out to be important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because the standard model of particle physics says they shouldn't have any mass. Um, and so if they do have mass, that's kind of exciting for particle physicists because it means that they actually need to do a bit more work and figure out why it is that the neutrinos have mass. From an astronomical point of view, it turns out actually to be quite important as well um, because one of the things that astronomers are very interested in is where the mass of the universe is located. You know, there's all this question about dark matter and we're very excited about the fact that there's some fraction of the universe we can't see at all. And of course neutrinos are, are in some sense very good candidates for dark matter um, because they're very hard, they don't really interact with anything at all so that you, don't, you never get to see them but if they've got some mass associated with them um, then actually they can contribute to the mass of the universe. And the thing is that the universe is so chock full of these neutrinos that actually even if each one has a very tiny mass associated with it, it can make a significant contribution towards the total mass of the universe. Every second through your body there's about 50 trillion neutrinos coming from the sun, 50 trillion, 50 times 10 to the 12, 50 million million neutrinos. Coming through my body. Coming through, it makes you feel a little bit, sometimes when you feel a bit itchy, you never know. Could be the neutrino. They don't interact with you, right? We don't feel them. They're desperately difficult to find. There's a huge number of them and they have virtually no mass. They also can change flavor. They can, they can switch from one to another. This was realized, uh, I think back in the 60s, so there's a very famous problem in astronomy called the solar neutrino problem, which for many years was, we, we did these very detailed calculations about the nuclear processes going on in the center of the sun. And from that you could predict how many neutrinos the sun should be producing. And then people did these very complicated detectors to actually detect these neutrinos. And when they set up their experiments, they found they weren't finding as many neutrinos as they were expecting. And yet the model to explain the sun worked really well. So what was going on? Where were these neutrinos disappearing to? And for a long time this was you know, believed to be because neutrinos are actually very hard to detect and so maybe we weren't as clever at detecting them as we thought we were or maybe actually there's something strange with the sun. Maybe the sun for some reason is not producing as much energy at the moment as we were expecting and therefore not producing as many of these neutrinos. It was realised that neutrinos with a mass could actually change from one to another. They could oscillate, change flavours. So a, a, an electron neutrino could become a muon neutrino and it could go the other way. But it turns out, actually, it tells us something rather fundamental about the neutrinos themselves, which is that if neutrinos were truly massless particles, then they, they can never change. A massless particle has to stay the same as itself. It can't transmute into another kind of particle. Whereas it turns out that if neutrinos do have some mass, then they can transmute. And in particular, there are actually three types of neutrinos, and the neutrinos can then flip between these different types of neutrino. So that was kind of the first direct evidence that the neutrinos had mass. If the neutrino has mass, why don't they hit us? Why don't they smack into us? And... Because it really is a very pathetically small amount of mass. So really the gravitational interaction between us and a neutrino is completely trivial. They really don't interact. They don't interact much by gravity. They don't interact much by elect electricity, electromagnetism, because they don't have charge associated with them. They don't even interact through the strong nuclear force, the main nuclear force. They only interact at all through this thing called the weak nuclear force, which is, as its name suggests, a rather pathetic force. So actually, the, they really don't interact very much with us at all. What, what really strikes me is how they were discovered. Uh, or the, uh, this, this is theory at its best. Um, how they were postulated. I mean, Wolfgang Pauli postulated these in the 1930s. He was looking at beta decay. He was looking at the, the decay of what we now know as the neutron decaying into a, into a proton. He realized, he used some of the most basic principles that we all learn about. He used conservation of energy and conservation of momentum 
to deduce that there had to be a particle there that no one had seen and that wasn't to be seen for years and years, for another 10 or 12 years. And this particle was later named by Enrico Fermi, an Italian, as a, a small neutron, which in Italian is a neutrino. So this neutrino is a particle identified by Fermi and it's associated with an electron. Every time the electron comes out, there will be the electron anti-neutrino or if an anti-electron comes out, called a positron, the electron neutrino comes out. So there is a quality about that associated with its electronness. So we call it the electron neutrino. Oh, but it's so difficult to detect these. So the way that they tend to be detected is deep underground. So the original experiment, the first one, for example, that was there to detect neutrinos from the sun, um, was actually a big tank of cleaning fluid, carbon tetrachloride. Um, and what happens is very, very occasionally, mostly the neutrinos just go streaming through these gallons and gallons of cleaning fluid and don't interact at all. Very occasionally, the neutrino will bump into one of the chlorine atoms uh, in this carbon tetrachloride, this uh, cleaning fluid, and transmute that chlorine atom into an argon atom. And um, so because it does interact through this weak nuclear force, and one of the things that this weak nuclear force can do can actually change the, the, the nature of a, a chemical element. So then you have the ultimate needle in a haystack, because somehow, or somewhere in this huge tank of carbon tetrachloride, so mostly chlorine, you've got to find one argon atom. If you can first of all build a detector of some substance which has a bigger cross-section for these neutri neutrally, neutrinos, then you're immediately going to increase your likelihood. And that's one of the things that people have done. They've built detectors made up of things that, that, that the neutrinos have a, a higher probability of interacting with. They, they use heavy water uh, because that's got a higher concentration of protons and neutrons in there, more densely packed, so then there's a bigger likelihood of the neutrinos basically hitting one and causing some kind of recoil of those particles and the little phonon of, of, of energy will be propagated out and you might detect it. It has to be a very, very direct hit and so the, there's this thing called a reaction cross-section which is essentially how big the, the, the nucleus looks like as the neutrinos piling towards it. And the point about neutrinos is the reaction cross-sections are tiny so the chances of actually hitting head-on enough to actually do anything are absolutely tiny. So these detectors have been built, one's in a deep mine in Sudbury, Canada. It's called SNOW, the Sud SNOW, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. One is a, uh, called Super Kamiokande in Japan. Again, these huge detectors which are filled with heavy water and, and then surrounded by scintillation uh, detectors. They're looking for little s sharp uh, signals of light. Now, the, one of the reasons you have to go deep underground is neutrinos are not the only things that will cause a sharp, a sharp signal of light. You've got cosmic rays, they're in abundance, we know they're everywhere. Well, they're not what you want to find here. So you have to go as far underground as you can or, or at least get into a situation where you're removing, say, those cosmic rays. Right at the beginning of the Big Bang, right at the start, before it even started, huge amounts of energy comes out and all the particles are created in this big moment. Well, I imagine that. I wasn't there. And so you get a huge number of electrons and neutrinos and all the other elementary particles and things that we haven't even seen yet, probably. And they decay down. And the electron neutrino is the lightest neutrino. And things will decay down. And there will be a big collection of electron neutrinos right at the start of the Big Bang. There will probably be other neutrinos as well, but that's another video for another day. We all very happily talk about what's known as a cosmic microwave background, the, the, the photons of light from the early universe, which provide us with in information about how the universe began and how it's evolving. Neutrinos, if we could get them, were all, would also give us even more information, and they're out there. These electron neutrinos travel through everything else very, very quickly. They don't get absorbed, and so they go through all the other particles in the Big Bang, and the universe in this small bang, as it expands, it becomes transparent to neutrinos and they cool down quicker than the photons do, which get absorbed by the matter. And so the neutrinos are said to be at two degrees Kelvin, whereas the photons, the particles from, of light from the Big Bang, are at a slightly higher temperature of 2.7. The, there's the equivalent of the 
photon background, there's an equivalent background in neutrinos. In fact, in this room, if I take a little sugar lump, the size of a sugar lump, there's about 56, maybe 60 or 100 of, of neutrinos from the cosmic, from the early universe. I mean the, those relic neutrinos that were around in the very early universe, not the ones that have been produced in the sun, which are piling through us. There are, there are about 56 in every cubic centimeter or so. So there's something like I, 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 you know, a billion or so in this, in this room right now from the very early universe. You know, just get hold of it and have a look at it. It'd be telling you so much. Well, you know, the main neutrinos we detect from space uh, are the ones from the sun. But actually, famously, some neutrinos were detected not from the sun uh, back in 1987. In 1987, a star exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud, supernova 1987A. Um, and it was obviously it was detected in light. People saw this sudden brightening of this star and so on, so it became incredibly bright. Um, but when they then actually went back and looked at the, the neutrino detectors around the world, they actually found that the neutrino detectors around the world had detected a spike of neutrinos at that precise, precise point. Now, a spike is pretty small in these terms because neutrinos are so hard to detect that actually even a supernova which gives out trillions of the things, very few of them will make it to Earth and even fewer of them will actually then be detected. So they actually detected around a dozen neutrinos from this supernova. You spend all your career trying to find these things out and the answers are here in this room all the time. About a billion of them. Just... where are they? <laughs> yes.